Tonight, the spotlight on Hockey Canada has just gone from intense to unprecedented. A new allegation of a group sexual assault has surfaced, and now a new investigation. Once again, a national sport is exposed. The culture of silence is condemned. As it relates to abuse, hazing, rookie initiations, and women. A momentous event years in the making is about to begin. The papal visit and many people know exactly what they want the Pope to say. We're sorry, forgive us. To say we created genocide, we created crime on your own country, on your own land. And when you're on a ferry, the last word you want to hear is fire. I was just in shock. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Neil Kirksal. Ian is away tonight. After months of widespread condemnation over its handling of sexual assault allegations, Hockey Canada faces yet another firestorm tonight over another deeply disturbing claim. It again involves members of the World Juniors team. They allegedly took part in a group sexual assault in 2003. Police are now investigating. Reaction to this latest allegation has been swift, and furious from inside the hockey world and out. Here's Lindsay Duncombe with what we know tonight. At Canada's shrine to hockey heroes, disgust. Like it's just brutal. Like you just kind of look down on that and makes you just kind of hate them in a sense, right? The latest allegations go back to the 2003 World Juniors in Halifax. What Hockey Canada describes as an alleged group sexual assault. In a statement, Hockey Canada said it learned of the specific allegations Thursday night from TSN reporter Rick Westhead, calling the explicit details deeply disturbing. TSN is reporting the victim was an unresponsive woman and that the incident was videotaped. CBC has not independently verified those details. Hockey Canada informed Halifax police the force confirms it is investigating. This just days after London police reopened its investigation into an alleged incident in 2018. A woman recently settled a lawsuit after alleging junior team members forced her to have sex with them for hours without consent. Laura Robinson wrote a book about sexual assault in junior hockey decades ago. It, it's very violent, it's very degrading, it's humiliating, and it's, it's in a group, and almost always it's videotaped. Former NHLer Dan Carcillo was playing junior hockey in the OHL in 2003. He says group sex with consent was common. It's pretty normalized. Uh, it was new to me when I got there when I was 17. Carcillo was part of a class action lawsuit alleging abuse while he played junior hockey. People are going to have to endure um, a lot of information that is going to continue to make them uncomfortable about what happens and what isn't spoken about uh, as it relates to abuse, hazing, rookie initiations, and women. The federal government, Neil, has pulled Hockey Canada's funding over its handling of the 2018 incident. And today, the Minister of Sport, Pascal saint ange said she is appalled and angry, adding, quote, it is clear that the culture of silence and the trivialization of sexual violence is well entrenched in the culture of the sport. So, Lindsay, what do we expect next from Hockey Canada? Well, officials from Hockey Canada, the CHL, the WHL, the OHL will all be grilled at a Parliament committee hearing in Ottawa next week. One of the committee members, MP John Nader, has information about this latest incident, so it is likely it will come up in those questions. He also urges anyone with information about what happened in 2003 to go to the police. Lindsay Duncombe in Vancouver tonight. Thanks so much for this, Lindsay. And the Prime Minister is once again calling for accountability in sport, this time as Ottawa freezes funding for Gymnastics Canada over abuse allegations. That's why we've uh, uh, made uh, clear requests of Gymnastics Canada and others uh, for more transparency to sign on to uh, accountability measures. The Minister of Sports says funding will not flow to that organization again until it signs on with the new Office of the Sport Integrity Commissioner. Today, Gymnastics Canada's CEO told CBC News he does plan to work with Ottawa.
we are fully committed to signing on to the new independent complaint mechanism. We're in constant contact with the minister and we're fully aware of her concerns and we have the same concerns. The Gymnastics Canada funding freeze was prompted by an open letter. That letter was signed by more than 500 current and former gymnasts alleging widespread physical, psychological and sexual abuse. After months of preparation and anticipation, there are now just hours to go until the papal visit to Canada. Pope Francis is set to arrive Sunday in Edmonton for what he calls a six-day pilgrimage of penance. The Pope is expected to apologize for the Catholic Church's role in residential schools. Julia Wong reports. They are signs of what is to come. Flags marking the papal visit to the Edmonton area. Preparations are taking place everywhere. City crews recently refurbished a piece of art called Dove of Peace from the last papal visit to Edmonton in 1984. Tens of thousands of people are expected to descend on the city. Residents have been told to expect road closures, detours and security checks. It is by far the hugest event of my career. Uh, we do have major events, but nothing of, of this scale. But it is more than preparing a city for the visit. It's also about preparing for the emotions expected to come with it. One university put together 300 care packages of scarves, tea and smudge kits for survivors and their families who will be staying on campus. Peggy Lee is a day school and residential school survivor. She's from Muskwachis, where the Pope is expected to apologize Monday for the Catholic Church's role in residential schools. We're on this mountain of reconciliation and this is just the beginning. Lee has been working on her own healing and is making sure to take care of herself. I ended up scheduling a, another appointment with my therapist and it turns out it, we scheduled for Monday because I know stuff may come up. Area chiefs say they expect the visit to take a toll. One is taking note of his mental health in the lead up to the visit. We had a chance, an opportunity, my wife and I, to sit with one professional and, and he just kind of slowly talked about, okay, this is what your expectations are going to be. Don't try and come up with solutions at that moment. Wait a while. That work below the surface is what some groups will be focusing on during the visit. Native Counseling is contributing 25 mental health and cu cultural supports to be at each of the sites of the papal visit. We are anticipating that the supports will be very busy. And Julia, we know the Pope is set to arrive there on Sunday morning, so walk us through what the first few days of his trip are going to look like. So, Neil, the Pope has a busy schedule. He will hold visits with Indigenous peoples. There will be a mass at Edmonton's Commonwealth Stadium, and there will be a pilgrimage to Lac St. Anne. The Pope will be in Edmonton for two full days before he flies off to Quebec City and then a Iqaluit after that. Julia Wong in Edmonton, thank you. Well, one First Nation in northern Manitoba is taking steps to help people cope with what will be an emotional and potentially triggering event. The community held its first ever healing camp, and our Karen Pauls was invited to meet those involved. In this old cemetery, Shirley Robinson reads from a monument marking the deaths of students at the St. Joseph Residential School. Forever keep in our hearts the memories and the spirits of those who did not survive. A survivor and the daughter of survivors, Robinson has also recorded the stories of other former students. There's times when it's very heavy. The stories are not far below the surface here. The community is using ground penetrating radar to identify possible unmarked graves on the grounds of what was once the main Catholic run residential school in the region. It's just a mission point we call it. That's where the, uh, the, the old residential school was. Donnie McKay was just eight when he and his younger sister were taken from their grandmother's home and forced to attend the school. What's worse, he could see his home across the Nelson River from the school. And I always called it a prison. We were illegally, illegally taken from our home. McKay and Robinson will be in Edmonton when Pope Francis apologizes for the wrongs done on behalf of the church. To prepare for that moment and to honor the work being done here at home, the community held its first ever healing camp this week. 
But not all survivors here are convinced the Pope's visit will bring any closure or help with their healing journey. Jackson Osborne says he needs to see the Pope touch a Bible and say, We're sorry. Forgive us. To say we created genocide, we created crime on your own country, on your own land. Back at the cemetery, the wind has picked up. It means that, that there's someone with us, and that's our creator. And I know he will journey with us to ensure that, that justice is served. Justice and healing for communities still struggling with the dark legacy of residential schools. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Pimichikamak Cree Nation, Manitoba. For anyone affected by residential schools and in need of support, there is a 24-hour line you can call. It is 1-866-925-4419. And a reminder for you now of what is ahead over the next week. The Pope's six-day tour begins this Sunday. He has stops planned in Edmonton, Quebec City, and Iqaluit. The National will be there with special coverage from Adrian and Andrew. A frightening ordeal today for nearly 200 people traveling on a ferry from Nova Scotia to Prince Edward Island. A fire broke out on board. The CBC's Steve Bruce has the details for you. With nearly 200 passengers aboard, this ferry had nearly completed its crossing from Nova Scotia to PEI when minutes from shore, something went wrong. The fire alarm started going off and we thought somebody pulled to be funny or it was the um, alarm to go back to your car. But um, I turned right around and there was smoke coming right from the, like the engine thing on top. It was kind of scary. It's just in shock. Like, I was just saying in my head, like, what the heck happened? What happened was a sudden fire in the engine room. The ferry captain threw down his anchors and stopped the ship in a shallow area close to shore. The Coast Guard and even local fishermen hopped in their boats and scrambled to help. Well, the first response was to make sure we can get everybody off it and safely and, and thank God, like I said, it was close to Wood Islands and and it was a perfect day to transport people. And we all got our life jackets on and they got the rips out and ended up putting the slide down and started evacuating people. Mm -hmm. Children first, it was kind of like a surreal thing where it's like, this is, is this really happening? It took about an hour after the fire started to get all the passengers ashore, all of them without injury. Though it could be days before they get their vehicles back, officials say they can't safely tug the boat back to shore until the fire burns out. You don't want to enter the, the engine room in order to introduce oxygen um, and reignite the, the fire. So without their vehicles and luggage, dozens of passengers' PEI vacations aren't exactly going as planned. They have been put up in hotels for the night. We're concerned about our camper, but I'm really glad everybody's safe and nobody was hurt and we all got away safely. This ferry was built in the 1970s and there are still questions about what went wrong here and whether anything could have been done to prevent this fire. Canada's Transportation Safety Board is now putting together a team of investigators to try to answer those questions. Steve Bruce, CBC News, Wood Islands, PEI. Two separate manhunts are underway tonight in B.C. Police in Chilliwack are looking for this 50-year-old man. He is suspected of killing two women yesterday. Eric John Chastello was last seen wearing black pants, jacket, and a black hat with an orange rim. The suspect was driving this Jeep. You can see the front part of the vehicle is yellow. Police say the shooting is believed to be targeted. Authorities in Port Coquitlam are looking for this man. Rabi Al-Halil escaped from jail last night. He was there awaiting trial on murder charges. Authorities say two other men seen here helped him escape. They were contractors or posing as contractors at the jail. Police say the three drove off in this white van. A guilty verdict against Steve Bannon today. A jury found Donald Trump's former advisor was in contempt of Congress. We may have lost a battle here today, but we're not going to lose this war. Bannon has refused to provide testimony and documents to the committee investigating the Capitol attack. Bannon's sentencing is scheduled for October his lawyers say he plans to appeal.
Ukraine and Russia signed a landmark deal today to allow grain exports to resume by sea. Millions of tons of grain are stuck in Ukraine, desperately needed by developing countries. Briar Stewart has the latest details. With war surrounding these fields in eastern Ukraine, the harvest is perilous. It's necessary to save the harvest even if it gets stuck in the porch, this farmer said. Most of Ukraine's grain has been stranded for months because of a Russian blockade. There's a backlog of 25 million tons. But today, some good news. After weeks of negotiations, a landmark agreement. It will bring relief for developing countries on the edge of bankruptcy and the most vulnerable people on the edge of famine. Ukraine is one of the world's largest exporters of grain, and the war has exacerbated a global food crisis, particularly in Africa. The deal was brokered by the UN and Turkey. Turkey's president said he hoped this could be a turning point towards peace, but Ukraine and Russia didn't go that far. Ministers from both countries signed the agreement separately, and they didn't sit together at the table. This sign showing the Ukraine and Russian flag right next to each other was hurriedly replaced by another, which had the UN flag between the two. Ukraine has accused Russia of stealing its grain and selling it. NATO allies, including Canada, say they'll be watching Russia closely. Russia is responsible for this global food crisis because of the wrong-headed decision they took to invade a peaceful neighbour. It's expected to take 10 days for Ukraine's ports to reopen, and experts say it will be challenging for the country to ramp up its export capacity to the level it was at before the invasion. Will we be able to get grain to export positions? Will we be able to get grain through, through uh, harbors to, onto boats and then out? So even if we can't get back to the original numbers, uh, doing anything will be a good thing. Because not only will it bring more money to Ukraine's farmers, it will help move grain to countries that desperately need it. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Toronto. We have an update tonight on U.S. President Joe Biden's COVID-19 diagnosis. White House officials say his symptoms have improved. The president is doing better. He slept well last night. Uh, he ate his breakfast and lunch. But Biden still has a cough, runny nose, and some fatigue. He is continuing to take Paxlovid, Pfizer's antiviral drug. The 79-year-old is fully vaccinated with two doses of Pfizer and two booster shots. The current wave of COVID-19 has some health officials talking about masks again. With cases surging, they are suggesting it may be time to put them back on. But as Lorenda Redekop explains, they're not quite ready to make it mandatory. <laughs> At this Ottawa coffee shop, they're asking customers to put on a mask when they order their cappuccino, but not demanding it. We're not refusing anyone entry. We're suggesting it. We're not enforcing it. We're not putting it on our door or anything like what people choose to do, individuals choose to do. The city's medical officer of health approves, making the same suggestion. We really are thankful for employers that are reminding their customers and their staff this is a mask-friendly environment. With a rise in cases, she says masks would help in crowded indoor spaces. Those are times when your decision to wear a mask is really still helpful. Helpful, but no talk of requiring masks. It was a similar message coming from Quebec this week. Wear a mask if you want. In this case, for older people going to see the Pope during his visit. They should be careful and should be there with a mask if they think that they are at risk, which is a personal matter. With the advice out of Ottawa for businesses to suggest masking, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business says that could lead to trouble. They may have to choose uh, about whether or not they're going to take in a customer or turn them away. Uh, and that's an incredibly tough decision and position to be in. Across the country, COVID cases are rising. In Ontario, hospitalizations rose by almost 500 in a week, a 66% increase, and 62 more people died. I don't think anyone wants masks to be mandatory. It may end up that we're going to have to have mandatory masking again. 
And that is starting to happen again in other parts of the world because healthcare systems are so overloaded. Ontario's chief medical officer has said right now he's not looking at bringing back mask requirements, but could in the fall if ICU capacity is threatened. Lorenda Radakop, CBC News, Toronto. As hospitals across this country struggle with staffing shortages, pharmacists in Ontario are hoping they can ease some of the pressure. They want to expand the scope of their practice to help fill the gaps in the health care system. Farah Morali has that story. Take care. Kiro Masse's pharmacy is a community hub in Toronto's East End. Between COVID vaccines, testing and treatment, it's been a busy few years. Pharmacists have already been doing a great deal over this pandemic to prevent things from escalating. As Ontario grapples with record long ER wait times and backlogs, pharmacists like Mossett believe they can help. When pharmacists are involved in the circle of care and they're part of the healthcare team, there is a reduction in hospital visits, there is a reduction in emergency room visits. Recent research out of the University of Waterloo backs up that claim. It found up to one-third of avoidable hospital ER admissions could be managed by a pharmacy team, which is why many Ontario pharmacists have called for an expanded scope of practice. Pharmacists are part of the primary care team, we hope, uh, uh, we believe, and uh, we, this, will, this should go a long way, I think, to helping alleviate some of the stress. In January of 2023, the province is expanding the scope of pharmacists. They'll be allowed to prescribe medication for up to 13 minor ailments, including pink eye, urinary tract infections, and allergic rashes. And while it's being welcomed by pharmacists, many say they'd like to see that list expanded further. There are provinces that allow pharmacists to prescribe for all medications except for narcotics and controlled substances. The Ontario Pharmacists Association says it would like to see a greater prescribing authority and the ability to do more point of care testing and routine immunizations. Three things that uh, will free up resources and make sure people don't end up uh, presenting themselves into hospitals. Back at Massey's pharmacy, he too believes the changes could go further and be brought in sooner. If it's set to start in January of next year and that's way too late. Adding, the time is now to take pressure off an already strained system. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. There is growing pressure to scrap the Arrive Can app at the border after travelers were ordered to quarantine even when it wasn't necessary. This robocall was full of threatening messages like prison time, so I figured I'm not going to risk this. Next, what the government says about a glitch in the system and the calls to stop using it. Plus, why hundreds of thousands of Canadians still cannot get their Nexus cards. Are you ready? And a spooky summer blockbuster promising a lot more than a few scares. Let's put it this way. Five years ago, I didn't think they would ever let me do that. We're back in two. The National, voted Canada's best national newscast. Welcome back. Tonight we are getting new details from Rogers on the outage that left millions of people across this country offline earlier this month. In a letter responding to Canada's broadcast and telecommunications regulator, Rogers says the outage was due to a network system failure following an update in its core IP network during the early morning of Friday, July 8th. The core network is like the brain that connects all voice, internet, data and TV for all Rogers customers. The company says the outage was not acceptable and that it has hired an external review team. Well, Ottawa is admitting there is a glitch in the ArriveCan app. Some travelers were mistakenly told to quarantine. The admission comes at a time when the federal government is already facing pressure to drop the COVID-19 travel app entirely. Sophia Harris reports. So this is what I do when I'm in quarantine. I do crosswords. John Souk has had a lot of extra time recently because he's been in quarantine without knowing why. Souk, who lives in St. Catharines, returned to Canada last week from a trip to Europe. He filled out the mandatory ArriveCan entry app for travellers and is fully vaccinated, which means he doesn't have to quarantine. But then, Souk got several strange emails and a robocall instructing him to isolate for 14 days. So he reluctantly complied. This robocall was full of threatening messages like prison time, so I figured I'm not going to risk this. 
but it turns out there's no risk. The federal government told CBC News that due to a technical glitch with the ArriveCan app, a small number of travelers received an erroneous notification instructing people to quarantine. You know what the government should do with that app? Throw it in the garbage. ArriveCan is a user-friendly digital tool. Travelers entering Canada must use ArriveCan to input their travel and vaccination information or face a 14-day quarantine, even a fine. But some politicians and tourism groups say it's time to scrap mandatory use of the app. Anything that is complicating the travel process, the travel journey right now, is having a negative impact on uh, the return of uh, people traveling again. The Public Health Agency of Canada says Arrive Can is a necessary tool that helps keep Canadians safe and improves processing times at the border. But the union representing customs officers says the app can actually create congestion. What we're experiencing is about 30, 35 percent approximately of travelers are arriving without having completed the app. And we end up having to help them do it. You're not required to quarantine. And but at least there's good news for Souk. Uh, he just got an updated email from the government informing him it had made an inaccurate request to quarantine. Now I'm free. Sophia Harris, CBC News, Toronto. And another travel headache drags on tonight, this one affecting Nexus, the joint Canada-U.S. pre-approved travel program. Canadian Nexus centres are still closed over a dispute with the United States on guns. Here's Rafi Bujakanian on the standoff and how it is causing new problems at the border. This is usually one of the busier border crossings this time of year. It's the beginning of the Quebec construction shutdown, so... Being one of the easternmost uh, stores in Ontario, we do get a lot of Quebec traffic. But it's been quiet for duty-free stores at land borders. They lost much business during the pandemic and it's only just coming back. Partly to blame, they say, the Nexus backlog. It causes additional congestion at the border because all those people that were traveling through the Nexus lanes, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. As Canadians keep waiting to be able to renew their fast travel cards to the U.S., Americans have been able to get new Nexus cards again since April. At issue, guns, says a Canadian government source. U.S. agents want to carry firearms while on duty at Canadian Nexus centres. Ottawa has so far resisted. And because it's a joint country effort, Canadian Nexus centres have been closed for months, resulting in a backlog of more than 340,000 Canadian applicants. There's frustration. CBC News checked in with Keith Lockman back in June. His application for renewal was pending. It still is. And he won't be tackling airports without it. We already know the rules. We've already been approved. It should be just simply a case of look at the file. Yep, we haven't had a problem with the person. There are uh, conversations and discussions going on with the United States. I think it's really important uh, that uh, we are able to uh, uh, stay true to our values as Canadians, but uh, respect the way we need to work together. Our government source also told us Ottawa expects to resolve the issue, maybe through virtual interviews. Until that happens, Canada's border guards say you can always try to complete your application in the U.S. Rafi Bujikan, CBC News, Ottawa. With extreme heat and wildfires here and across Europe, a quick question. Do you still have hope that we can stop the worst effects of climate change? Why some activists say fighting climate change is not a lost cause. A conversation about what gives them hope and the change you can make right now. And coming up later for you, a mystery solved. We now know what turned the sky pink in Australia. As people across Europe swelter under a deadly heat wave, firefighters battle destructive wildfires. This country has its own extreme weather to contend with. British Columbia's public safety ministry is telling people to have heat plants to deal with the hot, dry weather there. Large swaths of Quebec and Atlantic Canada are under heat advisories. Southern Ontario is under an extreme heat warning for a fourth straight day sign after sign that the impact of climate change is not an abstract idea or a problem of the future. It is a problem right now. We wanted to know how worried you are about what's happening. Hey, quick question. Do you still have hope that we can stop the worst effects of climate change? I hope so. I'd like to live in a better world. I'm hopeful if everybody, you know, pitches in and does their part. 
I don't think anyone has taken it forward as of now on a very serious note. From what, everything I hear, like everything seems to be very depressing on the news and everything we hear, so maybe not at this point. I'm losing hope. I'm hoping all these uh, world leaders play their part and basically help us out. Well, yeah, kind of losing hope, and I think that's pretty similar to a lot of young people. So what now? What can you do? We have two guests with us tonight to help answer some of those questions. Activist Sapporo Berman is in British Columbia and Kekasha Basu is in Toronto. So Kekasha, let me start with you. People want to be hopeful, as you heard there, but, but they're struggling to keep that hope. A, a poll on our Instagram account that we put up today had 50% hopeful, 50% not so much. So how do you remain optimistic? You have hope in the name of your organization. Yes, exactly. I named my organization Green Hope Foundation because I knew that we are facing so many challenges all around the world. And if we don't have hope, then we aren't going to be able to do anything to solve these challenges. And particularly in terms of climate change right now, what we are seeing is that it is hitting the global north now, and that is why people are kind of up in arms. But it has been affecting the global south for a very, very long time now. So for us at Green Hope Foundation, we have been working with these communities who've been dealing with the impacts of climate change for decades now. So it's been very important for us to have hope, to help in the mitigation and the adaptation and really ensure that these communities are able to continually rebuild. And we hope that we are able to take this forward in the global north as well. I think you've said that it's about resilience for you. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. It is about resilience and understanding that we might not see the results of our actions right away because we have caused a lot of damage to our planet, unfortunately, but I do believe that if we keep at it, if every single stakeholder comes together, then yes, we will be able to win this fight against climate change. Sapor, what, what do you say to people who say they believe that climate change is real, but they feel that the damage is already done? It's too late. We've squandered all our opportunities to do anything substantive about it. I think this narrative that we're hearing a lot lately, that it's too late is an excuse for inaction. And you know, we often hear that narrative from people who stand or companies that stand to benefit from the status quo, increasingly from fossil fuel companies or industries that uh, don't want to see the change happen. I don't think hope is something that you just have. I, I think it's something that we create. We create it with a shared sense of purpose with our actions. And anyone who says they exactly know what the future holds, I don't think is being truthful. If there's one thing we know about the world right now, it's unpredictable. And we also know that every action we take, every ton of carbon that we save from going into the atmosphere at this moment in history, it will save lives. We have a, we have a question from one of the folks we, we were out talking to today. I want to play that for you now. I think we have to look to like big corporations and um, stop putting the onus on the individuals to make changes. Kekashan, what do you say to that? Well, I believe that every single stakeholder has a responsibility. Of course, the private sector and big corporations have a very, very big role to play, but I don't think it should take away from the role that individuals should play as well, because the IPCC report clearly states that individual actions are just as important and again, every small action does count and every drop makes an ocean. So if every single individual, no matter which stakeholder group you identify with, including individuals in the private sector, if we are able to come together, then all of those actions, to echo what my fellow panelists said, they add up and we will be able to see change. So I don't think that individual action should just be pushed aside just because big corporations are contributing a lot to climate change. We heard questions about that too. What can I do in particular? I want to play you another clip. Uh, I'm not a modern expert, but well, there are people who should be able to look at this and say, what's the immediate thing that we can do? Sabor, let me bring you in on that as we talk about solutions, because people really are hungry for them. So what recommendations do you have, advice, as people look to get involved in their communities and try to get beyond that question of, of you know, can I actually do anything that will help? What can they do? 
Well, first of all, I, I think we all do have a responsibility in the climate era to engage, to do everything we can. But the mistake that we've made, especially over the last decade, is thinking that our individual responsibility is just in terms of our lifestyle, that we're consumers instead of citizens, that all we can think about is should we buy this car or that car or, or, or ride to work. We do need to make lifestyle changes. But what we really need at this moment in history is systems change. And that's the responsibility of, of our elected officials. And it's our responsibility to make sure that they know that we care. So I, I think what the most important thing that people can do is engage. Write to your member of parliament. Write to your, your provincial MLA. Call them. Make sure that they know that this is an important issue to you and that you will support them if they make the hard changes and change our laws and invest in the right kind of renewable energy and electric infrastructure, and that there will be consequences if they don't act. Kekhashan Basu, Sephora Berman, thank you both. I'm so glad we could speak. Thank, thank you. you. Well, ahead of the Pope's visit, some businesses in Alberta are busy gearing up for his arrival. Oh, I would love it if he came to eat. I would serve him fish and chips with maybe a Pope poutine. Next, the view from one restaurant where staff are scrambling to prepare for the Pope and the crowds expected to follow him. Welcome back. With Pope Francis set to arrive in Canada on Sunday, tonight we want to take you inside a small Alberta restaurant preparing for a big influx of customers. Good afternoon, Mama's in the kitchen. How can we help you? We have a lot of people phoning the restaurant even to ask questions about when the Pope's coming, why is he coming, how do we get there when he comes. It seems they phone us. We know a lot of stuff, I guess. <laughs> and yeah, it's going to be, it's huge. I'm Kim Sakodnik. I'm owner of Mama's in the Kitchen Restaurant and Catering in Alberta Beach, Alberta. Grilled cheese. Mama's in the Kitchen has been open for eight years now. We seat about 50 people. Uh, we do a lot of takeout. Okay, perfect, enjoy. That pilgrimage week, we're gonna be here 24 seven. It's, we have lineups out the door already. So imagining that many more people coming on that week, we're gonna be very, very busy. I'm thinking, you know, for the week itself, probably at least 100,000, 150,000 with takeout and in-house. We're preparing. <laughs> okay, you girls need anything? I've got very good staff. My staff are like family to me. They've been with me for years. Uh, my family's coming in, grandkids, kids. They're all gonna, everybody's coming in. Well, usually the younger ones, they'll help clean tables, wash dishes. The older ones, they'll help chop up vegetables, get things prepped for, for that day. Okay, after peppers, we're gonna have to do green onions. I've even had some community members say, Kim, if you need an extra hand, we'll come in and help. My husband's really good. He's gonna be on driving duty, so he's gonna go to town and get supplies when we need it, because we're only a small restaurant, so he's gonna have to do lots of tricks. Right now, Alberta Beach is buzzing. It's, we're all busy, all the businesses, the community. I never thought that the Pope would ever come to such a small little community. It is amazing for him to come. This is the second Pope I've met in my life. Uh, we were in Rome. I first met the first Pope in 77. That was a very memorable moment in my life and I'm hoping that my grandkids and my kids get the chance to have that same feeling that I did. Oh, I would love it if he came to eat. <laughs> I would serve him fish and chips with maybe a Pope poutine. <laughs> oh, great, thank you, I'm very glad you enjoyed it. I'm very grateful that we have this opportunity. It's very overwhelming. Nobody quite knows what to expect. I'll probably be walking around crying, but it'll be okay. Well, with my family and with my staff, we'll get through this. 
And CBC News will have extensive coverage of the Pope's visit for you throughout next week. Adrian will be in Alberta on Monday for the Pope's address. That special coverage begins at 11 a.m. Eastern on CBC Television and on CBC News Network. Coverage on CBC Radio begins at noon Eastern time. Robin Bresnahan and I will be co-hosting that for you. Well, when we come back, screams and subtext. Are you ready? Director Jordan Peele changed the horror game with the Oscar-winning Get Out. Now he's back with a new thriller. We'll tell you about the impact Nope is already having. I'm Tamara Kendacker on Nothing is Foreign, CBC's world news podcast. Europe's deadly heat wave this week could be the new normal, but is it enough of a wake-up call? Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. No, you are not looking at production stills from the latest season of Stranger Things, but for people in the Australian city of Mildura, Wednesday's eerily pink magenta, even sky, must have felt a bit like the upside down. It was actually caused by high-powered lamps at a local medical cannabis facility after workers forgot to close the blinds. Filmmaker Jordan Peele is set on bringing back the summer horror blockbuster. He's also reshaping the stories Hollywood tells. As Eli Glasner reports, Peele's new film, Nope, is being met with an enthusiastic yes. Are you ready? In the middle of a summer of sequels and superheroes, Nope is an event, an original must-see movie centered on a black cast from a filmmaker who promises scares and so much more. I really wanted to bring joy and adventure and I wanted to bring a little bit more of like the big summer blockbuster magic that I've, I, I, I just, I, I've been missing for me. The mixture of sci-fi and spectacle makes it the biggest film of Jordan Peele's career. It feels really good to be a director. Letting a black director put his vision into a, a film and commit to it. Let's put it this way, five years ago I didn't think they would ever let me do that. His 2017 debut, Get Out, a cutting look at race in America, changed that. Get out! Yo! Because not only is it such a tremendously effective film from a craft standpoint, from enjoying it as an audience member, but it made so much money. <laughs> it helped usher in a diverse wave of horror films brimming with subtext. Can you hear me? This Canadian horror director says Peel inspired her to embrace her own culture. I never would have thought of writing or directing a piece that was uh, so much more centered in a community and in a voice. And when I saw Get Out, it completely shifted how I thought I could tell a story. Horror aficionado Colin Geddes says Peel's comedy background brought more fans to the genre. People knew him as this comedy guy. Yeah. And now he's doing this pretty cutting edge horror thriller material. But he says there's a reason horror films are recession-proof. The times we live in are scary. But when you check in to watch a film, a horror film, you can turn it off at any point, And you can also realize, maybe my problems aren't so bad after all. Right. The, the horror film ends. Our, yeah, the <laughs> our horror, current reality yeah, does yeah, not. Yeah. And with more scares on the schedule, the horror appeal shows no signs of fading. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Tonight's CFL game in Edmonton is also sparking excitement. Yeah, I told her mom I'm going to be on radio, so she said she couldn't quite believe it, you know. <laughs> it's because he's about to be part of a historic night. We'll explain in tonight's moment. Inside the Winnipeg 50. They work from the 49. Tonight in Edmonton, it is the Elks versus the Blue Bombers, but for some, this CFL game sounds different. For the first time, the game broadcast is available in Cree. Wayne Jackson has the call during the Indigenous Celebration game, and we caught up with him just before the action began. And tonight, it's our moment. We're excited to be broadcasting our language across Alberta and on internet radio. It's actually a little, <laughs> it should have been done a long time ago, but uh, hey, we're here. We're going to enjoy our time. I think that's the most important part and something we want to pass on to our future generations. 
Nihi Oen is uh, Cree, as you, as you call it, is a very descriptive verb-based language. So we have to actually use a lot of descriptive terms that come up with some terms. So we have to do another word such as uh, the, the pastor, we, we been you. And then uh, things like uh, first down, second down, those are uh, words that uh, we've had to come up with. So instead of say first attempt, second attempt. So it's a bit of a challenge, but hey, we're, we're up for it. I just came from visiting my mom and I uh, told her, mom, I'm going to be on radio. So she said she couldn't quite believe it. You know, she's going to hear her, her son uh, speaking the language and uh, promoting the language. So for me, it's a good feeling and uh, I'm actually getting emotional right now. It is a beautiful language and it went beyond the audio as well. They actually wrote the team name Elk on the field in Cree. And before the match, the Canadian national anthem was performed in Cree and in English. That is the national for you on this July 22nd. I'm Neil Kirksaw. Good night.